The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. This week, I speak with personal branding expert, Carly Iron. She has worked with some huge names, huge I wanted to bring it back to little old us and think about how can we make sure that in 2023, because I think we're probably all now planning for 2023, we've got a strategy and a clear plan to show up authentically, not only in our office, but online as well. She's going to myth bust all of the excuses people use to not have a strategy around personal brand. And I am telling you, I think I have used every one of them. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Hi, Carly. Hi, how are you? I'm so good and I'm very, very excited for today's chat. Mm, I think this is such a nice time of year. I I don't know. I have learned years ago that business planning should be done November, December at the very latest for the year ahead. And so I am running around (laughs) curating my thoughts about what I want to achieve in the next 12 months in 2023. And I thought getting someone like you on would be really valuable to the financial advice community that is XY, because no doubt what you do might be very aligned to what some people are looking to do within 2023. So for people that don't know about you, I would love to start today's conversation by learning a little bit more about who you are and your story, because it's cool. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, Gosh, where, where do I start? I'll give you the abridged version. Uh, so that relates really to what I'm doing today. So I like sure. to always start by saying I am a high school dropout or more honestly, I was kicked out of school. So left school <laughs> very young, uh, spent many years partying, decided that wasn't the life I wanted to lead. I know you're, you're probably sitting there going, Oh God, she's really going all the way back. Um, no, it's but- <laughs> great. It's great. Do, please okay, do. Okay, perfect. Um, but then what happened was woke up one morning, had a cigarette for breakfast and thought, wait on, this isn't exactly how I want my life to look. And ended up, long story short, living at a very exclusive health retreat for two months and ended up at the end of those two months as an aspiring health and wellness guru. So no one wanted to invite me to dinner parties because I was preaching about what you should eat, (laughs) what exercise you should do. And when I came back, I was really clear that I wanted to be in the health and wellness space, but I didn't know how at that point I was, I was just a young lad, ladess. Mm -hmm. And through a whole series of synchronicities, I had a gentleman who today is one of my mentors say to me, I think you'd be great in PR. So that was the beginning of my PR career. I was 20. I went to college, started studying PR, had my first three clients in the first six months of my college studies. 
and then mm. launched my own PR consultancy. And what started out as just a, a desire to spread the word uh, around health and wellness then turned into a much bigger picture of representing high profile individuals with all varied backgrounds, all different stories, uh, all different purposes, uh, but getting their story out into the world. So I did that for well over a decade, Mm -hmm. went on extended maternity leave and realized I had never done anything to build my own personal brand, which a lot of people discover at a junction in their life where they're going through change. And Mm. that has led me now to be out in the world that's been over four years. I consult and coach and speak about personal branding. I'm very passionate about the topic. I think now more than ever we can become so visible and use our voices for good. And so that's what I'm doing today. Wonderful. (laughs) Wonderful. Because I think in our world... We need to we need to myth bust up front. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of people that are going to listen to this podcast and go, I don't need any strategic planning around my personal brand mm-hmm. because I'm a good person yep. and I do a good job yep. and that will continue to bode well into the future. Yeah. What do you say to people that think like that? What I would say to a person that thinks like that is there's no doubt that being competent at what you do and doing a good job is important. But what a lot of people don't recognize is that their influence and brand is very much tied to their position. And so what happens, which was certainly the case for me, is I had developed over the years a lot of positional influence which whilst I was in the role I was in was wonderful. It would open doors for me. It would help create relationships, word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. But then when I went on extended maternity leave and for other people that might be selling their business, changing their role, uh, becoming redundant, it might be a whole number of reasons that has led to them needing to leave the role they're in. And then they go, oh, all of that influence that they had, that ability to open doors, the relationships even that they had was based on a position rather than the personal relationships and personal influence. And it is a very clear distinction. And I've had a lot of clients, uh, some who have held very high roles, discover that the hard way, as I did, where I from went from one minute, everyone wanting to know me, everyone wanting to connect, everyone wanting to do all of these things for me, to the next minute, but as they say, crickets chirping because I wasn't in the position anymore. I think this is very true in my world, um, also around the company that you work for. Mm-hmm. So people are scared to build or don't bother maybe to mm-hmm. build a personal brand because they think, well, the company that I work yeah. for is very reputable or the organization that I work for is well-known and well-credentialed and they sort of use that. They ride yeah. off the coattail of the brand. Is that common? Very, very, very common. And I, especially in today's marketplace where there's so much rapid change, I have heard so many war stories of individuals and very intelligent executives doing that and as a result – when they even politely get their marching orders because the company's restructured and they need to change. I have one client in particular who's just popping to mind, 15 years at the same brand, big, iconic, international brand, and did exactly what you just said, just always sat on and relied upon the credibility and the power of the brand she was working for, Mm -hmm. then found herself no longer there and scrambling. Because, like I said, she and and she was definitely a person where she had a lot of positional influence. But the minute that was taken away, she didn't have that personal. And, of course, there was still some, but not necessarily built in a strategic and sustainable way. I guess the scary thing with stories like that is you might think that you have cultivated a brand that sits behind, you know, a bigger identity. Yeah. But I guess you don't really test that until something like the story you just said happens. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, you might realize, oh, dear, what I thought versus what is real are quite different. 
And that's really hard, I would imagine, to then build that back because of a whole number of reasons. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's just occurred to me that that would be a really shit time to figure out. <laughs> yeah. I didn't do a very good job of this personal branding thing. In fact, I did a really great job of talking about the company brand yes, really well. Yes. And now who am I? And I'm yeah. floating in the middle of the ocean yeah. and I've got a bit of an identity crisis that I need to solve. Absolutely. And look, I think that a lot of it, no, I think I know a lot of it is generational as well. I, you know, anyone over 40, myself included, we didn't come up through our careers being told that this was an important component. I had one uh, gentleman who, I hope you don't mind me swearing on this podcast, but he is. I do, I do regularly. Welcome, okay, welcome well, to my swearing podcast. Perfect. <laughs> so he was a, a, a very well-liked uh, journalist at the Australian Financial Review and we were sitting down having a coffee and I was telling him about this new direction that I was going in and, you know, personal branding and coaching and speaking. And he said to me, you know, Carly, and he was a little bit older. He is a little bit older than me. He's in his 50s. And he said, you know, we grew up being told you put your head down, you bum up, you work hard, and that's how you're going to get somewhere. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to argue with a journalist from the Australian Financial Review? This could be a very long conversation. And before I even had to say anything, he just said, what a load of shit that was. And mm. I think that speaks volumes to what we're mm. talking about here is, yes, putting your head down and doing the work is important, but also periodically you know, putting your head up and going, who can see me right now? Who knows me right now? And are they the people that I want to be seeing and hearing me? Uh, so that, you know, we can cultivate and continue conversations and connections, et cetera. So for all of us who are not overly schooled in this area, let's yep. start from real basics. Yep. What is a personal brand? So my definition, so I'll start mm. there, mm. is that a personal brand is ultimately the way mm. a person is recognized and remembered. That's really what we're trying to shape. It's that the perception of who you are, what you do, so how you're recognized and remembered. What that entails is how you bring together all of your unique qualities, skills, values, image, you know, all of who you are, how you package that up in a way to shape how you are recognized and remembered. What a lot of people do is they just focus on and think about personal branding in terms of their LinkedIn profile. And, and it's all about what they do. So they focus on really communicating, this is what I do. This is what my role entails. Uh, and it's completely lacking of any personality, any storytelling, you know, anything that really lets another person get a sense of who you are, what you value, your unique style, how you do the things you do in only the way you do them. You know, all of these things that we understand when we're building relationships in the physical dimension you know, when we sit down with clients, as I'm sure, Jess, you would know, mm. when you're talking to a client about, you know, offering financial advice, you don't just sit in and jump into it. You want to get to know the client. What are their mm. values? What, you know, what do they do in their life? What do they love? You know, when you're going through that journey of building a relationship, that's where you, we start as humans. We're looking for that connection point. Uh, but then what happens when it comes to communicating that to a broader market, we tend to freeze up and just go, this is what I do, and not really allow people in to who we are. You talk a little bit um, about the storytelling piece and actually sharing your journey and your yes. past. I thought that was really interesting. It's taken me a long time to become brave enough to share some things mm -hmm about me for a few reasons. A, I've never thought they were relevant. Yeah. B, some of them were a bit embarrassing or, you know, they weren't things that I necessarily thought I wanted to share with the world. Um, but also I felt a little bit 
narcissistic. Like, yes. right? I was like, why would anyone want to know this stuff about me? Am I just like becoming self? Is this an e- is this my ego trying to feed my need? But actually, no. You advocate for people needing to learn who you are to connect with you. Yes. Have I read that correctly? A hundred percent. And, you know, I'll put it back to you two ways. When you're getting to know, even let's say on a, the level of a client relationship, are you open to sharing, you know, what you did on the weekend, um, mm. maybe a hobby, where you traveled to, you know, you're selective with what you're sharing in person and you're sharing intuitively And even on a subconscious level, you're sharing that information to create connection. Mm. So they are getting a sense of liking, knowing, trusting. Now, I want to make this really clear, Jess. And Mm. as much as I advocate for sharing storytelling, I am not sitting here saying you need to expose all areas of your life. You need to go to the deepest, darkest corners of who you are as a person. And that's what a personal brand is. And a lot of people get caught in this idea of, oh, but you know, I want to be authentic. Uh, And they struggle with this idea because who they authentically are at work with clients is not necessarily who they authentically are at home with family or who they authentically are in a, at a party with friends. And this is where in psychology they call this the context principle. It's about remaining authentic to who you are in a particular context. And when it comes to personal branding, you're essentially deciding, well, what part of me, what facet, what dimension am I putting out and on show? I don't believe that every single part of you should be on show. There are parts of you that should remain sacred and it's only for the people who get to see Jess at home with family or get to see Jess in a party. I am a really firm believer of that. So you said something that's so key. When it comes to storytelling, actually asking yourself, well, how is this relevant to the reader? What are they going to get from this? Is this a lesson that you learned that could be helpful? Is sharing vulnerably allowing somebody else to feel a sense of not being alone in their struggles and, you know, helping them get through it. That's why you're sharing. It's not just, hey, look at me, this is what I did, because that's where I think the narcissism might come in. But if you think about it, Jess, when you're on social media, as an example, because this is a lot of where we're connecting with people these days, do you like reading other people's stories? Of course. And of course, before I front, you know, and and obviously given the world that we are in, we have conversations that these people may not have had with their bestest, bestest friend. So we are privy to really private, sensitive pieces of information. And so it makes complete sense that someone, even if they've been referred, what I often hear from people is, oh, you you work with my friend or you work with my colleague or you work with my cousin and they've said great things. Mm -hmm. And then, because I think this is an important part, I went online and I read about you and I saw you and you resonated with me. Because, of course, if I'm going to share my deepest, darkest things, I want to make sure that I'm the right person, you're the right person for me to do that with. So, yes, and it makes so much sense. I think for me it's just been a big barrier I'm going to also call out. I worked for Macquarie Bank for several years. Hello. I loved yeah. working there. Yeah. But I was actively taught to not put personal stories and everything that we needed to put out into the world. Yeah. And I totally get it with really big companies. Um, yes. You need to be very careful about what people are putting online because people can do really odd things. Yeah. But that's taken me years to get to a point where now I feel like actually, Carly, in the last three months, I basically decided I can't keep avoiding this. I need to get better at this. Mm. And I have shared some vulnerable stories in the hope that it helps people and the hope Mm. that people feel less alone. And the number of people that have reached back out to me and privately messaged me is astonishing. I feel silly that I didn't do it earlier. Yeah, yeah, you didn't do it earlier. Exactly. And it's addictive as well because you – you know, to connect with other people, like really connect and, and, and 
I think there's something magical about just owning your story and mm-hmm. and sharing it. I think there's something really magical. I think that it's not only a benefit and a gift to those who encounter it and, and feel that sense of connection from you, but it's also mm. sending a very clear message to you and your subconscious that your story is of value and it does matter. And I believe that is a building block, a very important building block in self-belief and, you know, healthy everything. Totally. Because imposter syndrome is real. And sometimes I still put things out and think, ah, yes. is this? Is this gonna is this gonna land how I want it to land? Yeah. And I think fear holds us back from presenting the personal brand that we might want yes. to because we're scared that it's not gonna land right. Yes. Yeah. What do we do about that? We're totally afraid of rejection. We're social creatures and the idea of being ostracized for who we are is is terribly frightening. But the reality is if we hide uh, out of the fear of not being accepted, then we're actually not accepting ourselves, which I could think of nothing worse. And you're not allowing yourself to be exposed to actually attracting the right people, places and opportunities into your life that are actually aligned with who you are. So yes, there is that stepping into the void and there that fear of doing so but I think the payoffs are worth it because ultimately the thing that you're afraid of being rejected by the people that aren't really your people means that you'll be accepted and attract the people that actually are your people. And there's no avoiding that. There is absolutely, I always say to, to, you know, all my clients in every workshop I've delivered, the more you put yourself out there, the more rejection criticism and negative feedback you'll get. And I don't say that to scare people off. I Mm. say it to be realistic because what happens is people go, oh, I'm putting myself out there. Oh, my God, I got a negative comment. And, of course, they can have 20 positive comments and one negative. And then they go, oh, maybe I need to change something because I got a negative comment. But to me, and I can say this having represented high-profile individuals who you know, we're getting a lot of exposure with big audiences. Uh, No matter who you are, you are going to get criticism. And criticism is generally a sign that you're playing a bigger game. So it's a good thing that you're getting it. If you're only getting compliments, it's a small, you're playing a small game. Mm, That is a very good insight. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing Don't wait till we feel ready. The fear and the rejection thing is not going anywhere. We just got to park that to one side, go anyway. And when we start getting negative stuff, you know that you've hit the spot because (laughs) we're not for everyone. You're not for everyone. Exactly. I I read somewhere, I can't even remember where I read it, but uh, even, and I was only just the other day listening to a podcast, Oprah was talking to Elizabeth Lesser. And she was talking about when she sold or or left the Oprah show and then created this new, the O Network. And Mm. she was talking about all the critics that she got. And now this is Oprah. Like you you think of Oprah as being one of the most loved people in the world, but she's got her critics. People don't like her. You know, it's, it doesn't matter who you are. Even Mother Teresa had her critics. Mm. So if you're, If you see that as a sign you're doing the wrong thing, then you're always going to be a prisoner to that. What do you do if you are not a naturally confident and or extroverted person? Because I would imagine for many of us, I think I am technically actually an introvert because I get energy from being alone, Mm -hmm. but I'm a confident person. And so I can sometimes just be like, I'll just do it. Yeah, figure it out later. But there would be a lot of people that are more introverted and and don't feel the same as me. How do introverts build personal brands? So I am an introvert, uh, 100% introverted. Mm -hmm. And I have written a guide about this, you know, which is on my website because it saddens me to think, and I was one of these people that had automatically assumed, given I am an introvert, and I don't like being the center of attention. I don't like being the one on stage. I don't like being the one that's being interviewed or sharing my thoughts online. 
then obviously I'm just meant to be behind the scenes. And that is a very unfortunate line of thinking because we are then missing out on a lot of talents, insights, stories, experiences from effectively, I don't know what the stats are, but I would imagine it's a big part of the population consider themselves introverted. And I think what mm-hmm. Susan Cain has done with her book Quiet has been phenomenal because suddenly introverts are going, oh, yeah, I'm an introvert. And it's almost trendy to be an introvert and to really mm-hmm. own your introversion. So there are two things here. Firstly, owning the fact you're an introvert, but not using that as an excuse is important. So that means, for example, things like when I do an interview like this, I know I'm going to need to go for a walk after because I need to come back to myself. Or if I do a big workshop or a big presentation, I know that the next day I'm wiped. Like I can't do meetings. I can't speak. I've been in situations where I've done a big talk and I literally can't speak. I almost miss my plane, that kind of, you know, because it's, it takes so much out of me to do that. But if you know that, then you can plan and schedule around it. So that's the first thing. But secondly, if you follow the work of Dr. Russ Harris, who talks about confidence, he always says that the feelings of confidence only come after the action of confidence, which to me is my mantra. So if ever I'm feeling, oh my God, I don't feel ready. I, I'm not confident enough to do this. I always come back to this, that the thought that I'll feel confident by just preparing mentally or getting into the zone, it's absolute BS. You actually have to do the thing before you will feel confident. And there's no out, there's no going around that. To your point before, like if you are confident and you are an introverted person, but you've sort of gathered that up, it could be that you're playing very small. It could be that you've not pushed yourself because comfort feels so much nicer than yes. being brave and doing something that's scary. Yeah. I guess we have to hold space to be honest and say, am I doing something as as brave as I could? Could I be doing this differently? Am I trying to just keep myself within my comfort zone because it feels good for me and yes. it's worked for a heck of a yes. long time? Yeah. Even though the world has fundamentally changed that we play in. Fundamentally changed. And mm. there is, uh, you can obviously clearly hear Jess, I read a lot of books <laughs> and I know you do too, so that's great. But <laughs> There's a book um, which I highly recommend. It's called Authentic Gravitas by a, a lady by the name of Dr. Rebecca Newton, who's actually Australian, but she's a professor at the London School of Economics. Okay. And she always she talks about this idea of authenticity, where it becomes powerful is when you are authentic to your intentions and the impact you want to make. Where we get caught is thinking of being authentic. That's just who I am. Uh, That's how I've always done it. That's who I've always been. Oh, LinkedIn, no, that's just not me. Oh, social media, no, 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 that's, that's just not me. I'm not like that. But then when you ask yourself the question, well, is remaining authentic to that idea, is that actually allowing you to fulfill your intention and the impact you want to make? And if the answer is no, then you need to change your behaviors because you're remaining authentic to a part of you or a version of yourself that's not actually allowing you to go to where you want to go. Mm. You know? That's and a, mm, I'm like, I'm, so, I'm, I'm digesting you're this. digesting that one, marinating that one because I think for me when I read that, I was like, yes, I hear clients say to me and whether it's at a workshop or I'm speaking or my one-on-one coach, coaching clients, oh, I'm just not like that. And I was like that too. You know, when I was at that fork in the road of, well, what's my next career move? I'm the quiet one. I'm behind the scenes. But it means that by staying behind the scenes, I'm not exposing myself to potential opportunities and the next stage in my career, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't working for me anymore to, to be that person. Do you know, I just want to say um, that sometimes people contact me because I do a lot of public speaking and sometimes people say to me, oh, I wish I could public speak. You know, mm. I wish I could do that or whatever. I am here to tell you that I get 
scared still yeah every time that i do it yeah. it doesn't go away for me yeah i have put systems and practices in place i've done a lot of training yeah um i remind myself that feeling uncomfortable is part of the journey and that i would be un unhappy with myself if i didn't try it but like i just want to miss bust it in case anyone sits here thinks yeah, but like you do all this speaking yeah. and you can get up on stage. I'm like, yeah, but I am often terrified. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And most people are. Yeah. Most people are terrified on stage. Yeah. Uh, but we wouldn't ever imagine that because we automatically assume that those people who are on stage in the spotlight are obviously confident. Mm. Um, but that's that's not not necessarily the case at all. I also shared the story when I did a live television interview for the first time. First of all, when I pitched to do the interview, I when I sent the email to the producer, I ran downstairs to my husband and I was crying. And he was like, "Honey, what's wrong?" And I was like, "Oh, I pitched to to do this TV interview." And he's like, "Yeah, and and I was like, well, what if they say yes?" Uh, because they're so far outside of my comfort zone. Then they said yes, and I went and did the interview. And I did the interview, and then I went outside into my car and cried like a baby again because I was so far outside of my comfort zone. It felt so foreign. But if you had have watched the interview, you would have assumed, oh, she's confident, she knows what she's doing. So. Brilliant. Yeah, I like myth busting as well, Jess, because and and especially when it comes to introverts mm. and and why I'm so passionate about sharing the fact I am an introvert is because that doesn't that's not an excuse. Totally. I think that's a wonderful thing to make sure people mm. are not using to shield yes. themselves from yes. because in Australia we are not moving the dial on how many people are getting financial advice. Mm. There are not enough advisors, but we aren't really help. You know, I think it's two in 10, but it's been two in 10 for like a decade. And so I mm. wonder if having the opportunity for people to learn more about advisors, learn more about who we are, what we stand for, what we're about, that we're humans, that we're not scary and intimidating, that we're really yeah. nice, mostly kind people. I wonder if that will really help people to resonate and go, oh, I thought they were going to be these actuarial style, no offense, people yeah. who are all numbers, but actually no, most financial advisors, they're, they're really good EQ. And so helping yeah. people learn that and reduce those barriers, I think it's just going to help more people get advice, which we know leads to such better life outcomes for people. Mm, well, said. okay. You have built, you've built so many good resources, by the way, I've read them and you've got like oh, workbooks and like literally if you are sitting here going, this is great, but like, what do I do? I need you to know that Carly has built like brand identity guides, introvert guides, where you literally have a workbook where she asks good, amazing questions and you have to sit and write, thank you. Honestly, You're thank welcome. you. Because I find learning about this stuff really great, but then we want to know yes. well, how do we take this into practical, tangible yeah. action? You have clearly solved that. But one of the things I want to talk about is this, concept of the three C's. So content, yeah. consistency, and conversations. Yeah. Can we do a bit of a deep dive? So if we're like, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> I will become braver and I will try this. Yeah. This is sort of your recipe for success. This is your recipe for success. This sort of three C mm -hmm. model. Can we talk a little bit about if you're trying for the very first time to get this right, what should people think? About? Let's focus on content first. Yeah. What are the things that we need to think about if we're going to build our brand identity? Mm -hmm. So specifically around content and your, Correct. okay, perfect. So firstly, it's about sitting down and really thinking about, okay. And there's a beautiful framework, actually, it's a Japanese word called Ikigai. Have you heard of that? Yes, yeah. with the Venn diagram. In yeah, the middle. with the Venn yes, diagram, which is kind of hard to explain on a podcast. But if you can imagine there's four circles and then they're all overlapping and Ikigai is all about your calling in life. And I also like to use them as, well, at the intersection of these four circles is also your personal brand. And I'll give you some real life examples in a second. So the four questions are, what are you really good at? What do you love to do? What problem are you solving and for whom? Mm -hmm. And what can you be paid for now or in the future? 
right? Mm-hmm. And at the intersection of those four, so you, you literally would write down, okay, what am I really good at? And is there a particular part of financial advice that I'm really, really good at or that I'm really, really passionate about? Okay, what do I love to do? Now, this might be, you know, what do you love to do in your career and as a financial advisor, but it could also be, I love dancing and I love traveling and I love wine, right? Mm. Just write it out. Don't edit yourself. Then you go to what can I be paid for now or in the future, which is obviously in the case of most of the listeners today, it's financial advising. And then who is the problem you're solving and for whom? So then at the intersection of that is not only your unique personal brand, but where we can start to build out your content pillars. So let me Mm -hmm. give you a real life example of this, how this would be put into play. So I was doing a talk for uh, Beersdorf, Nivea, and a lady came up to me at the end of the talk and she was like, you know, I'm really confused about this whole personal branding thing because I feel like I've got a split personality, which I hear a lot. People compartmentalize their life, right? Okay. And when it comes to personal branding, that's not the right way to do it. But hear me out. So she said, I I love what I do in my corporate role. And she was a training manager. And she said, and then outside of that, I love dance. I'm a choreographer and I'm equally passionate about both. And when it comes to personal branding, I feel like I have to be two different people on different platforms. And I said, okay, so let's look at the intersection between these two worlds. You think they need to be compartmentalized. I said, what's the commonality between the training and the work that you do and the dance choreography? And she said, I'm not sure. It doesn't make sense. And I said, okay, well, when you're training, are you telling people certain steps so that they can get to the same outcome all in the same way? Yes. When you're doing choreography, are you teaching people certain steps? Yeah. And she was like, oh, yeah, I get it. So all of a sudden there's some really unique analogies. There's some really unique storytelling. There's a way for her to link her narrative that's really unique to her. Mm. So all of a sudden we're learning, okay, she's really competent and passionate about training, so there would be a content pillar there. But she's mm. also really great at dance choreography. And perhaps there's a way to bring the two together in a storytelling method so that people go, oh, wow, I get it. And it's still speaking to her what she's wanting to do. This concept of content pillars is new to me. I have learned that I have accidentally created content pillars, which is funny. Um <laughs> But actually, now that I have gone down this interesting rabbit hole, there's a lot of resources online that will help you understand your content pillars. And then creating a strategic plan of posting and showing up within those content pillars so that you're reinforcing your message. I mean, this is clever. It's very clever and it takes time, right? It, It takes time, yes, and I believe it's something that will be constantly evolving because you might Mm. go down one direction and then that direction leads you, you know, through real time feedback from the marketplace. All of a sudden you see that your audience is asking a specific question and it allows you to go deeper into another specific area, which then might become your area of specialty. Yeah. So it, it does take time and it's, it's constantly evolving. And we probably just need to myth bust that when you do all of this beautiful content, you get your content pillars and you start doing the thing and showing up, you have to be consistent. Yes. Right? Is there a formula of like what does consistency mean in the concept of a personal brand? That step of first identifying what your content pillars are is key. So Uh really knowing. Okay. So for me, as an example, my content pillar is personal branding. I Everything, if you go through my LinkedIn all of my articles, uh, all of my posts, everything on my website, it all it goes into one main content pillar of personal branding. That's for me. Mm-hmm. I have a client who's in leadership and he, he one of his content pillars is the company and, and what the company stands for. The other is wellness because his whole business philosophy and leadership philosophy is founded on the idea that when we are well, we do better work. So he has two content pillars, the what the, act, the company actually does 
and then this idea of wellness. Mm -hmm. So once you've identified them, yes, the strategy part is really easy because you've got this new benchmark and litmus test to go, okay, is this story related to my content pillar? Mm. And then you'll know, or is this story, how can I make this story related to my content pillar? Which then means you're not jumping around all the time and having people question what does she actually do or what is he really good at or because mm. you're not jumping around it's all confusing it would be like when you read a vogue magazine jess you wouldn't expect to see a story that belongs in national geographic mm. i'd much prefer to read natural Ge- geographic <laughs> okay and, good but, but okay. i know exactly what you mean um so once you've done that, because I, I, I think you can fall in the trap of like, I'm too busy. I'm too busy to post. I'm too busy. And so lo and behold, you post once every quarter, few months, and you yeah. hope to cultivate a yeah an easily identifiable brand. Yeah. I would imagine that you would say, no, that's not enough. Is there any thoughts or tips for how consistently we need to be doing mm. this It really depends on a few things. So what are you using social media for? So if social media, if you are wanting to have more of a passive approach to social media, what I mean by that is you said earlier in the call, having that place where someone can just come and look you up, then that's a more passive approach to social media. It means that Mm. you've curated your platforms in a way that means when someone comes and looks you up, you're telling the story and you're projecting the image that you want. In which case, that more ad hoc, whenever you want to say something approach is fine because you're only using it as a place for them to come and look you up. If you're using social media as lead generation, you're using it as a place to create a community, then absolutely just showing up ad hoc is not going to work. You need to have a systematic approach so that people can start to depend on, you know, we're so habitual, we don't even realize how much, how habitual we really are. So they want to know that every week you're going to be showing up. It's like you, Jess, I don't know how many interviews you post a week, but your audience will know, hey, Jess, there'll be a new interview this week, or there might be two new interviews this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you just posted whenever you felt like it, then it's very hard for the audience to get involved in that. Uh, and for you to create a community. How much you post, so let's come back to social media, it actually depends on the platform. So a platform like Instagram is very, very hungry and it's a very, very busy platform. So if you post something, it's probably only going to last in people's feeds for 24 hours because there's so much there. Uh, Twitter, again, it's very busy. And you need to be on it quite a lot for you to build that traction. What I love about LinkedIn and especially why it's a platform that I thrive on and it's definitely the strongest one for me is I can post something and three weeks later it's still making the rounds because of a community of I believe they say it's 700 million people, only 3% of people are actually posting. What? Yeah, it's a very, very small percentage that are actually posting. So there's a lot of people on there, and I wouldn't say that 700 700 million people are actually active on there, but let's say even half of that, it's still a very small percentage. So the amount of eyeballs you can potentially get because it's when you're not competing with as many people is quite phenomenal. Mm. I have, and, and this is why there, I've had clients say to me, oh, yeah, I go on LinkedIn, but I never post and I never comment because I don't want people to see what I'm doing on there. So you have a lot of voyeuristic behavior on LinkedIn. Wow. So really interesting. I could spend hours talking about LinkedIn because I just think right now it is the most exciting place to be. Um, some people say to me, because I work with younger people, um, yeah oh, no, we don't do LinkedIn because we work with young professionals. And I'm here to tell you that LinkedIn for us in our world has been underrated, really underrated. And people often say to me or have said to me in the past, 
you're always on LinkedIn. And I'm like, no, I am not always on LinkedIn. Apart from my hiatus um, when I went on my mini retirement this year, I was posting once a week. Yeah. Once a yep. week. That was it. But it was this it was this belief that people were like, she's yep. always on there. I'm like, isn't that fascinating that I'm actually yes. not on there a lot? Yes. But it's the consistency. Yep. Mm. Exactly. And because it, there's not as much competition for space. So potentially they're seeing every single post they, because as you would know, if you post on Instagram, let's say you have a thousand followers, I don't know how many you have, but a very small percentage of those people will actually see your post if you're not paying to play. So it's not like an email database where you send it out to a thousand people and a thousand people will get it, whether it goes to their junk mail or not, I don't know, but it still gets out to a thousand people. On social media, you're only ever getting out to a small percentage of your audience unless, like I said, you're boosting your posts and doing things like that. So with LinkedIn, because there's just not as much happening uh, in terms of content creation, and it is changing, people are starting to get, you know, starting to become aware of it, you will find the people going, wow, you're so busy, aren't you? I've seen you, you've been doing so much. And you're like, what? I had the quietest week ever last week. But they do have this perception of you being out there doing all these things because they're seeing you regularly. Amazing. Yeah. I'm conscious of time because I think this is a fascinating area. It's an area that I pushed onto the important but not urgent list yes. for a long time and I winged it is probably yeah. how I would politely describe my approach to yeah. personal brand. But if you can leave us, before we get into rapid fire questions, with anything else, I mean, you've provided some amazing insights and some I'm going to call them hard truths for us <laughs> to take from today's chat. But is there anything else that you want us to really understand about personal brand before we wrap up today's call? I love that you just admitted that you winged it in the beginning. And you know what? That would lead me to say, good. I would encourage people to wing it in the beginning because what that will do is allow you the space and time to experiment and really get a sense of, practicing and and asking yourself is this me is this the message I want to say is this how I want to present myself and knowing that you've got a you know a much smaller audience to begin with so you're not having as many there's no expectation there's not as many people looking at you like now is the time to experiment right at the beginning is the time to Mm. experiment Mm. there's this perception of you know it's easier for the people who've got big audiences that is so incorrect it's actually more pressure. The bigger the audience, the bigger the expectation. Mm. So there's more pressure to serve and to be consistent in the way that the audience wants you to be, which is not always a great thing for those people who are high profile because they feel, I think Will Smith said on his 50th birthday, he had the realization that he didn't have to always be that Will Smith, like he wanted to be whoever he wanted to be, but he had kept himself prisoner in one way because the audience expected him to be that way. I mean, Will Smith's probably not the best example based on his uh, (laughs) recent behavior, but don't slap people in public. Um, Mm, That's a good personal brand lesson. If that's the one takeaway that you take from today. Um, But I know what you mean. You know, I've never really thought about that, but you're right. Like once you have built Yes. A community that want to learn from you, that want you to show up. You kind of have to build things that are going to be learned from and show up. Yep, exactly. (laughs) So experiment, wing it in the beginning. Don't, you know, don't get fall into the trap of perfection. Your best idea is probably out there. What matters is you just come back to the question of, and I know it's easier said than done, but come back to the question of what's the story I'm wanting to tell? What's the image I'm wanting to project? And who do I ultimately want to be? Like, where am I actually going? You want the vision of your future self to ultimately guide you in your personal branding decisions of today, because it's not a short-term activity. It's a long-term mindset. You're investing your time and energy and resources into something that isn't going to have a direct return on investment, but it's about building the network, building the relationships, building the audience and the community that will ultimately benefit you in the long run. We talk so much in our world about it, about the concept of compounding, and I can see exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Actually, over time, this accumulates and compounds and turns into something really beautiful and special. Yes. Thank you so much. Quickly, 
I think everyone as an action item before the year is out should take the workbooks off the website, print them and physically do them. I am Perfect. creating some accountability to me to do that. Perfect. Um, if people want to learn more about you and the great work that you do, how can they find you? I'm definitely on LinkedIn. So yes, please connect with me on LinkedIn and my website, carlylion.com. Wonderful. I'm going to add that in the show notes as well. Thank before you. we wrap up today's chat, how do you feel about some rapid fire questions? Go ahead. Woohoo. Okay. Ready for it. Thank you for being super enthusiastic. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to know one thing that you do to look after your mental health. Walk in nature. Mm. That's Beautiful. a big go-to for me. What is a piece of advice that you would give to younger Carly? The feelings of confidence will only come after the actions of confidence because waiting to feel ready, confident is a big fat illusion. It never happens and it's not even worth aiming for it because it's not, it's not real. What a beautiful lesson to impart mm. to all of us. Yeah. Do you have something that's on your bucket list that you can share? My bucket list is overflowing with so many things. And for me, I am a avid scuba diver. So mm -hmm. if I could live underwater, I would. I'd be a mermaid. Uh, and there I'm a mermaid, yeah. So <laughs> there my bucket list is full of, of locations and my dream board, which is right next to me, full of places I want to dive. So that that's definitely on my bucket list. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, last question. I know you felt a little bit of pressure about this. Yes. I would love for you to give us a recommendation for a book for my fake book club. I really do feel pressure around this question know, because I have do. to tell you, I have so many amazing books that I absolutely love. Um, but I did mention Authentic Gravitas by Dr. Rebecca Newman. I would highly yeah. recommend that. And then for all of those introverts, sorry, Jess, I know I'm breaking the rules, but there is one book that I think for the introverts out there who, you know, maybe financial advisors, there might be a, I'm not sure, Jess, I don't know if they they skew introvert or extrovert. Or there's a mix. Doesn't. There's definitely a there's mix. There's a mix. I would go for The Alter Ego Effect by Todd Herman. The Alter Ego Effect by Todd, Todd Herman. Mm. Really impactful book. Carly, I want to say a ginormous thank you so much for today's thank conversation. For I have learned a lot. You've given me many tools and ideas and no doubt the community as well around how to show up authentically and have a strategy around our personal brand. So thank you, thank you so much for being today's guest. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>